going over the world we knew once when you walked beside me. We'll be back with the second half of the Popeye Hour. Here's another interesting story that's in the news. In the news, rattling and rolling to the Olympics. Ice skating in the Olympics made Dorothy Hamill a star. Now, some roller skating champs want to become big Olympic wheels, too. We'll be back with roller skating in the news. Sponsored by new Hubba Bubba, with bubbles that won't stick to your face. He's a coming! He's a coming! There's gonna be a gun fight! <laughs> There's a brand new bubblegum in town named a Hubba Bubba. It's soft, juicy, and delicious. Best of all, Hubba Bubba lets you blow great, big, fat bubbles. <laughs> that won't stick to your face. That gum, my bubblegum? Big bubbles? No troubles. <laughs> you Hubba Bubba bubblegum. And now, roller skating in the news. Roller skating is becoming one of America's popular pastimes. For some, it's a new way to disco. For others, it's just a lot of fun. But some really good skaters long for the chance to compete internationally. The trouble is, roller skating is not accepted as an Olympic sport. Getting a sport or game into the Olympics isn't easy. It has to be popular in at least 40 countries on three continents. There has to be a long record of participation in world and regional competitions. The last new contest to be admitted to the Olympics was judo in 1948. Roller skating has already met all these requirements. For 42 years, roller skating championships like these in Texas have been held around the country. Some of these super skaters are graceful and talented, like Olympic ice skaters. And like the best of them, roller skaters take a few spills, too. This year, roller skating was included in the Pan American Games. And with its increasing popularity, there's new pressure to have it admitted to the Olympics. But 1988 is the very earliest that could happen, and other sports like tennis, badminton, and baseball are also waiting to be admitted. I'm Christopher Glenn with Roller Skating's Olympic Hopes in the News. helping young people with their health problems. This health care center on Long Island specializes in treating and counseling young people. This special kind of health care is in the news. Sponsored by Kellogg's, because your best day starts with breakfast. Lego, my new Eagle strawberry flavored waffle. Lego, your what? Lego, my new Eagle strawberry flavored waffle. Did you say strawberry? Uh-huh. No, you didn't say let go my Eggo regular waffle. Or my Eggo blueberry waffle, did you? Uh-uh. Oh, delicious Eggo waffles just like homemade with that great strawberry taste. Did you say strawberry? Let go my Eggo. Start your good breakfast with new Eggo strawberry waffles and regular or blueberry flavor, too. From Kellogg's. Young people between the ages of 12 and 19 have outgrown their pediatricians, but they often have special health problems. Now, some medical experts believe adolescents need doctors specially trained to treat their problems. On Long Island in New York, medical specialists have set up a health care center that is only for young people. Although the atmosphere is informal, the medical care is first rate. Joyce Ann Shapiro is a typical patient. She has been a diabetic for nine years. After her doctor takes her medical history and tests her, she is given some advice. She's told to watch her diet and restrict the amount of sugar she eats. After that, she talks to the clinic's psychologist. Young people often feel they are alone with their problems. But when they come to a clinic like this one, they see others with similar problems. Instead of going to a regular doctor, he has from like little kids to teenagers. Right here, they have just adolescents. And like I think after 
all adolescents, they know what like everybody's about. Everybody around here is like really friendly. You get to talk and meet new people. Once a week, the entire team meets to discuss certain patients, their treatment, and their progress. At which time we decide. There are only about 100 clinics like this one throughout the United States, but more and more doctors are realizing the need for this kind of care. Medical care for young people is in the news. Easy does it with Frankie Avalon. Lots of music and laughter. Easy does it new this summer. Premiering Wednesday night on CBS. In the news, one short minute that wrecked lives forever. This week, an earthquake struck one of the Philippine islands, killing over 3,000 people. In a moment, more about this earthquake disaster in the news. In the news is sponsored by Nabisco. You'll find quality in our corner. Oh, hi, Big Fig here. No, no, that's not the Newton. Hit it, Hal. Ooey gooey, rich and chewy inside. Left, right, take a bite. Golden flaky, tender cakey outside. Up, down, turn around. Big Newton case from the Fisco. Oh, you can't do the Newton if a Newton it's not. But if it's by Nabisco, a big Newton's what you've got. Let's do the big, 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 big Newton. This week, the southern island in the Philippines, Mindanao, looked like this from the air. An earthquake struck Tuesday, wrecking thousands of lives and millions of dollars worth of property. The Philippines are right in the middle of the Pacific section of what scientists call the earthquake belt. Eight out of ten major earthquakes occur in this belt. The quake did its worst damage on the southern coast of Mindanao. Most of the damage came from a huge tidal wave that rolled in from the Celebes Sea with waves up to 18 feet tall. A tidal wave is set in motion by an earthquake under the sea. Scientists know that earthquakes happen when there is a shifting of the Earth's surface. They know that parts of this surface are in motion all the time. The mountains, which we see today, in ancient times were undersea rocks. Scientists have good ways of measuring small and large shifts of the Earth. They measure the vibrations of the Earth with instruments called seismographs. They hope one day to have precise ways of predicting when and where earthquakes will happen. But the scientists just don't know enough yet to help people like these in the Philippines. Most had little warning of the earthquake. About all they can do now is to pick up and try to recover from the terrible effects of this week's earthquake disaster in the news. In the news, an ice skating superstar. At the Winter Olympics this year, Diane Deleu won a silver medal. Today, Diane is working hard on a new kind of skating career. In the news. In the News is sponsored by Nabisco. You'll find quality in our corner. Hi, gang! <laughs> Big Fig here with that great new dance, the Newton. <laughs> Hit it, Al. of training and hard work go into the winning of an Olympic medal. But what happens to an athlete once the dream has been achieved? Diane Deleu, the silver medalist at the Winter Olympics, has not retired from ice skating. She is now the star of a touring ice show, something quite to her liking. I'm finding it that I have to go out there every night and give a performance, which in the past I'd be training and working up for one big event a year. And now you go out there and you just do your number and it's a great relaxed feeling. You just are out 
there to enjoy yourself and have the people enjoy you. Diane was born in California, but in the Olympics, she skated for the Netherlands. Both her parents are Dutch, and that means Diane is both an American citizen as well as a citizen of the Netherlands. She chose to skate for the Netherlands six years ago. People made it seem like I had just gone to the Netherlands that year, but I have been competing there for six years in the national championships, and I originally went there to represent the Netherlands in international competition because in the United States, it's really hard to get into international competition. They can only send three from this whole country. And so I went there when I was 14, and right away I made the world team and started competing, really got a lot of experience. Diane DeLue is now skating toward a new goal as an ice show star in the news. Show tonight at 6.30 on 8. In the news, making good on a campaign promise. Hoping to restore faith in public officials, President-elect Carter recently set up strict guidelines for his appointees. A code of ethics is in the news. In the news. During the campaign, President-elect Jimmy Carter promised to restore people's faith in government by setting up strict rules of conduct for public officials to follow. True to his promise, Mr. Carter last week established such a code of ethics. Part of the code states that political appointees must make detailed reports of their finances and sell or place in trust businesses which could conflict with their government jobs. To comply with his own rules, Mr. Carter must turn over the family peanut business to a person, unknown as of yet, to sell or lease. Ever since Mr. Carter emerged as a political candidate, attention has been focused on his family peanut business, a good example of the conflict of interest issues officials frequently face. Peanuts are a high-risk crop. A farmer can have one good year and the next be wiped out completely because of a crop failure. Because of this, the government guarantees the peanut growers that it will buy all the peanuts they are unable to market. Many legislators want to change this law. If a bill is passed changing the guarantee, as president, Mr. Carter would either have to okay the bill or veto it. To avoid a conflict of interest such as this between his job as a peanut farmer and his job as president, Mr. Carter gave up his holdings in the peanut business. New guidelines for government officials are in the news. Next, another interesting story that's in the news. In the news, Uncle Sam wants to count you in. In just two weeks, your family will receive a 1980 census form in the mail. It's important to stand up and be counted to fill out that form. We'll be back with the reasons in the news. Sponsored by the makers of Crayola products. Crayola crayons. It's fun to create with Crayola. You can make a purple lake with fish both thin and fat. Or a happy birthday cake and goofy party hats. Crayola crayons. You can make a ghost to take to funny puppet shows. You can make a spotted snake that grows and grows and grows. Cause it's fun to create with Crayola. Crayola crayons come in this box of 64 different colors with a built-in sharpener. Now, the 1980 census in the news. A census is a counting of people, but the idea of the 1980 census isn't just to find out how many men, women, and children live in the United States, but also where they live and how rich or poor they are. The federal government gives about $50 billion a year to cities and towns. How much each gets depends on the number of people who live there. A poorer community with a large population gets more federal money than a smaller, wealthier town. So it's important to get an accurate count. But in the last census, in 1970, the Census Bureau figures it missed counting more than 5 million people. Most of the people missed were poor or members of minority groups, the people who should benefit the most from federal money. The problem is that some people are afraid of the census. For instance, people who are not legal residents of the United States. Most sneaked into the country looking for work 
and they're afraid if they fill out a census form, they'll get caught and be sent back to their own country. But the government promises that all census forms will be absolutely secret. It says no one should be afraid to fill them out. So look for your family's census form around March 28th and make sure it gets filled out. I'm Christopher Glenn with the 1980 census in the news. The Bugs Bunny Roadrunner Show will return after In the News and these messages. Next, another interesting story that's in the news. In the news, the bus of the future goes bust. They were supposed to help carry commuters into the 21st century, but in many big cities, these buses aren't carrying anyone, anywhere. We'll be back with Busted Buses in the news. Sponsored by Post Honeycomb, the cereal with a big bite and big taste. The road goes here. Gonna bulldoze the Honeycomb hideout. What's big enough to stop us? Yeah, stop us! Honeycomb is... Honeycomb's big! Tastin' right! Really big! Big, big taste! Big, big bite! Honeycomb's all right! Starring all my outstays! And Post Honeycomb cereal is part of this nutritious breakfast. <laughs> big, big bite! And now, some troubled buses in the news. They're called advanced design buses with sleek, squared-off bodies and big, dark windows. They're supposed to be more comfortable, easier to get onto and off of, and they use less fuel than older models. But they have big problems. In several cities, officials have pulled many of these new buses off the road. In Houston, the air conditioners kept breaking down. In Atlanta, there were also brake problems and cracks in the bus frames. New York City pulled more than 600 of the new buses off the road after cracks were found in support frames on many of them, and one bus's engine fell out. In Los Angeles, more than 200 buses were out of service because of cracks. These buses are made by the Grumman Corporation, the same company that built the Lunar Lander, which put men on the moon. Grumman has promised to fix the faulty buses, but there's a slew of legal problems. Meanwhile, officials in New York had to figure out a way to ease the crunch caused by losing 600 buses. They got some help from Washington, D.C., which is leasing New York 100 buses it had stopped using. Those buses made the trip to New York last Saturday, and some were put to work just before Christmas. I'm Christopher Glenn with Bus Problems in the News. <laughs> Here's another interesting story that's in the news. In the news, the future of Alaska's wilderness. Congress has set new rules to keep parts of Alaska's wilderness the way it is and to let developers into some other parts. We'll be back with the Alaska Lands Bill in the news. Sponsored by Ronald McDonald and all his friends at McDonald's. Presenting Ronald McDonald in The Great Conductor. A little McDonald's hamburger music, please. Now, Alaskan land in the news. Our 49th state is more than twice as large as Texas, but with fewer people than live in Kansas City. Alaska is America's last frontier. It's so big and so wild that some mountains and rivers haven't been given names. Congress has been talking for nearly four years about keeping more of Alaska's wilderness just the way it is. This month, Congress reached a decision scattered areas of wilderness adding up to more land than there is in all of california will be set aside restricted in various ways slightly more than half of the newly restricted land will have total wilderness protection no mining or logging will be allowed the rest a little less than half will be restricted in many ways 
but some oil exploration, mining, and timber cutting will be allowed. Suddenly, with this bill, Alaska will have two-thirds of America's national park land. Many Alaskans object to having the federal government tell them what they can and can't do with their wilderness. On the other hand, many conservationists and environmentalists want Congress to put even more restrictions on the use of Alaska's wilderness. Both sides say they'll try to get the new Congress to make changes next year. I'm Christopher Glenn with Alaska's Wilderness in the News. In the news, a sudden surge in airplane hijacks. After several years of relative quiet, the skies between Miami and Havana are busy again, with hijacked jetliners heading to Cuba. We'll be back with airplane hijacking in the news. Sponsored by Chuck E. Cheese's. You can smile, America, with Chuck E. Cheese. You can smile, America, with Chuck E. Cheese. You can smile, America, with Chuck E. Cheese. Food and games and all kinds of features. For a taste of pizza time theater, you can. Now, airplane hijacking in the news. It seems like every other day this month, someone has taken over a plane heading to or from Miami, Florida, and forced it to fly to Havana, Cuba. Taking over a plane and forcing it to fly to somewhere other than its destination is called hijacking. The word goes back to days when bandits would hold up wagons and carriages on the road. Many of them would hail potential victims with a cheerful hijack, then rob them when they stopped to answer the friendly greeting. Airplane hijacks have been going on for about 15 years. Airport officials have installed x-ray machines and metal detectors to find bombs and weapons. Even with tight security, a few hijackers still get through. Some hijackings have been for political reasons, but most of those to Cuba have been due to homesickness. Cuba is an island nation just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, but the U.S. does not have formal ties with a communist government there and there are no regular flights between the two countries. But there are many Cubans living in the U.S. Many came over in a huge boat lift three years ago. Now it seems some of them want to go home, and they figure hijacking is the only way to do it. Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner will return after In the News and these messages. In the News, Henry Kissinger returns to government. Former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was named this week by President Reagan to head a special commission on Central America. We'll be back with a look at Henry Kissinger in the news. What do you want to call your cookies, Mr. Keebler? Chips what? Well, let's see. The chips are big. Chips big. Wait, they're soft, too. Chips soft. Our chocolatey chips are so big and soft, they practically melt in your mouth. We put them in cookies made with real eggs and brown sugar. So we need a name that's special. Call them Chips Deluxe. Chips Deluxe. That's special, or my name isn't Cecil B. Deluxe. Chips Deluxe, with big, soft, chocolatey chips. In reaching a final solution. And now, America's best-known diplomat in the news. When President Reagan formed a special commission this week to recommend future U.S. policy on Central America, he turned to Henry Kissinger to head the panel. Kissinger has been an advisor to President since the 1960s, and he was Secretary of State under Presidents Nixon and Ford. Kissinger was born in Germany and came to the U.S. just before World War II to escape Hitler. Kissinger first got involved in government in the mid-1950s. As President Richard Nixon's national security advisor, he led secret talks with North Vietnam aimed at ending the Vietnam War and won a Nobel Peace Prize for his work. President Nixon's historic visit to China in 1972 was set up on an earlier secret visit there by Kissinger. Perhaps Kissinger's best-known diplomatic mission was his effort to end the 1973 Arab-Israeli War. It was dubbed shuttle diplomacy because he was constantly flying between Mideast capitals. 
And rather than leaving negotiations to U.S. ambassadors in each country, Kissinger met personally with top leaders to work out an agreement. Kissinger's style of personal diplomacy has been controversial. Many people don't like it or him. This week, some members of Congress condemned his new appointment. Others praised it. I'm Frank Setapani with Henry Kissinger in the news. Monday on Square Pegs is Benny Patty's true love. Excuse my me. Ben. Guess who slept with Private Benjamin last night. Judy's mother moves in Monday. This is CBS. Bugs Bunny and the Roadrunner will return after In the News and these messages. In the News, lakes without life. New York's Big Moose Lake is one of hundreds of lakes that are dead or dying. Fish and plant life are being killed off by contaminated rain. We'll be back with Acid Rain in the News. Sponsored by the many fine products of General Foods. Alfie, the beans are missing from Alphabet. Nancy McEvil again. Get him, Alfie. <laughs> Post Alphabet cereal, part of this nutritious breakfast. It's doggone good. Rainy day. Wait a second. Here's an animal alphabet poster and stamps from A to Z. Zebra. Zebra. A poster and one of two sets of stamps and specially marked boxes of Post Alphabet cereal for rainy day or any day fun. And now, acid rain in the news. Acid rain looks, feels, and smells like any other rain. But the water in acid rain carries poisons like sulfuric acid. That acid and its effects have been blamed for killing fish and plant life in hundreds of lakes in the northeastern United States and Canada. Scientists say the acid rain starts with factory smokestacks and exhaust from cars and trucks. Those fumes mix with moisture in the air. The mixture, they say, forms high over the Midwest then falls back to earth as rain in the east. Acid rain has made the water in some lakes too acidic for fish to survive. Big Moose Lake in upstate New York looks great from the surface, but underwater is another story. About 30 years ago, residents started noticing that fish in the lake were dying. Today, very few fish survive there at all. Dr. Dwight Webster, a scientist at Cornell University in New York, has been working on breeding a strain of brook trout that's better adapted to surviving in acidic lakes. But he says his work can only provide a short-term solution. A report delivered this week to the head of the Environmental Protection Agency is believed to say that the best way to reduce acid rain is to force factories to cut back the sulfur dioxide that comes out of their smokestacks. I'm Doug Poling with continuing concern over acid rain in the news. In the news, moose hunting in Maine. Hunting moose on a limited basis became legal in the state of Maine three years ago. This week, there was a vote on whether to ban Maine's annual moose hunt. We'll be back with moose in the news. Sponsored by the many worlds of Kenner. Strawberry shortcake with custards on the way. Two joint three dolls who have come here to stay. <laughs> Each doll with pets sold separately. Hi, Almond Tea with Mazda Panda. Me, Lent Tulip with Marshmallow. And Cafe L.A. with Burrito. Let's spend the day in the park. Is wise. Pandas like trees. Yeah, ducks like water. Sea girls like shade. And what do cats like? Nice friends like you. Strawberry shortcake with custard. Almond Tea with Mazda Panda. Mint Tulip with Marshmallow. And Cafe L.A. with Burrito. Each sold separately from Kenner. And now, moose hunting in the news. The moose is Maine's estate animal. About 20,000 moose thrive in Maine's forests, helped by Maine's lumbermen who clear huge wooded sections, thus making giant salad bowls for the plant-eating moose. Hunting moose was banned in Maine in the 1930s, but limited hunting began three years ago. Maine now has an annual lottery in which a thousand hunters win the right to kill a single moose during a six-day hunting season. 
But then came SMUSA, the letters stand for Save Maine's Only Official State Animal. SMUSA collected 40,000 signatures to put a moose hunting ban on the ballot. People against the moose hunts say the moose are too dumb to be fair game. And a cartoon character named Bullwinkle joined the campaign for the ban. Sportsmen in Maine were not amused. They say the hunt, which can kill at most only a thousand moose a year, controls the growth of the herd and keeps it healthy. Good wildlife management, the sportsmen call it. And they say banning the hunt in Maine would set a bad example. Other states might vote for more bans on hunting. An unofficial check of paper ballots cast this week gave the results. The ban was soundly defeated. Limited moose hunting will continue in Maine. I'm Christopher Glenn with Moose Hunting in Maine, still awful in the news. This is CBS. In the news, the Philippines and President Reagan. Mr. Reagan has put off plans to visit the Philippines, blaming a heavy workload in Washington more than political problems in the Philippines. We'll be back with the Philippines in the news. Sponsored by the many worlds of Kenner. It's Ewok Village. I must see my friends. Let's set. I'll get them. Dear me, what a close call. It's C-3PO, new low gray in Ewok Village playset. Action figures, eat sold separately. You have to put it together. I'm low gray, the Ewok medicine man. Take me to your leader. Your throne, oh golden king, will celebrate with special stew, a barbecue. No celebration for me until my friends are free. Very well, your majesty. Ewok Village playset from Star Wars Return of the Jedi collection. Action figures sold separately. New from Kenner. And now, the Philippines in the news. The Philippines, an island nation in the Pacific Ocean near China and Japan, is an important ally or friend of the United States. Once it was an American colony. Now there are huge U.S. military bases in the Philippines. These bases make it important for the U.S. to maintain friendly relations with the Philippine government. But relations were strained in the past during military rule in the Philippines and seven weeks ago by the airport murder of Benigno Aquino, leader of the political opposition and a former presidential contender. Aquino was with government security guards when he was shot and many Filipinos suspect the government or the military was behind the shooting. President Ferdinand Marcos says the murder was a communist plot to damage his government, and he appointed a commission to investigate. But many people upset over the Aquino murder have demonstrated against Marcos. He has outlawed protests, and police have often used force to stop the demonstrators. President Reagan had planned to visit the Philippines at the beginning of an Asian trip next month. But amid protests from Congress and concern for his safety, the president decided to put the Philippine visit off for a while. Officially, Mr. Reagan expects to be too busy with Congress. In the news, a summer of spy stories. The news this summer has been filled with real-life spy stories from America, the Soviet Union, and West Germany. We'll be back with a look at real-life spies and what they really do in the news. <laughs> and now, spies in the news. This has been a very active year for spy stories. Former U.S. Navy man John Walker was arrested earlier this year, accused of directing a family spy ring that sold U.S. naval secrets to the Soviet Union. Walker's son, Michael, and brother, Arthur, were also arrested. This month, the U.S. State Department charged that Soviet agents were using a potentially hazardous chemical dust to monitor the movements of American diplomats in the Soviet Union. And another huge spy scandal is still unfolding in West Germany, where several government workers have mysteriously disappeared. West Germany's chief spy catcher apparently turned out to be a spy himself for communist East Germany. The use of spies goes back at least to biblical times, when Moses, leading the Israelites through the desert, sent spies into the land of Canaan to report what lay ahead. Spies today gather information on such things as movements of naval warships and submarines, and they try to steal secret codes used to conceal classified communications. Some spying is done electronically, 
Experts suspect the glass boxes atop the new Soviet embassy building in Washington, D.C. are designed to eavesdrop on sensitive telephone and computer links. But people are still the most important links in most spy networks. I'm Christopher Glenn with Spies and Spying in the News. This is CBS. In the news, dealing with nuclear weapons. President Reagan says the United States must build more nuclear weapons to be in a good position to negotiate with the Soviets next week about having fewer of them. We'll be back with Arms Talks in the news. I see, I see, it tastes so wonderfully, wonderfully, and all that vitamin C, you're gonna love I see. With I see fruit drinks, you get a full day supply of vitamin C, and a real fruit taste that's so cool and so delicious. You're gonna love I see. And now, nuclear weapons in the news. Ever since the first atomic bomb was dropped on Japan nearly 40 years ago, people have been talking about doing away with nuclear weapons because of the massive destruction they cause. But since the United States and the Soviet Union both have nuclear weapons, each side has felt it had to keep building more of them to offset what each sees as a threat from the other side. There have been many talks about limiting these weapons and several agreements. But it's been 13 years since a pact has been approved by both sides. The next round of nuclear weapons talks opens next week in Geneva, Switzerland. But while the U.S. is talking with the Soviets about reducing the numbers of nuclear weapons, President Reagan is urging Congress to approve funding for construction of 21 new MX missiles. These missiles would each carry several nuclear warheads. Mr. Reagan insists that a refusal by Congress to approve the new missiles would weaken this country's hand at the negotiating table. Meanwhile, research continues on what are called Star Wars defensive weapons. These new devices would operate in space, and President Reagan hopes they could use advanced technology to destroy nuclear weapons in space after launching, but before they could reach American territory. The Soviets, who are believed to lag behind the U.S. in developing space weapons, want the research to stop. I'm Christopher Glenn with Nuclear Weapons Talks in the News. In the news, what are black and white and fall over in a row? Dominoes, like these, of course, except these aren't just black and white, and they did more than just fall over. We'll be back with record-breaking dominoes in the news. And now, dominoes in motion in the news. Fifteen college art students in Japan auditioned and even got medical checkups before they were allowed to join a team which set a new world record recently for toppling more than 700,000 dominoes. You had to be healthy to spend 35 days setting up dominoes in a hot school gym. The temperature sometimes hit 95 degrees. Air conditioning wasn't allowed. The slightest breeze, or misstep for that matter, could do terrible damage. And you never knew when a bug might get in the works. Finally, with the push of one domino, they all came tumbling down. The Tokyo Broadcasting System sponsored the fun and starred the dominoes in a Japanese TV show. The tiles formed some extraordinary pictures during the 35-minute extravaganza. Sometimes they even seemed to ignore the law of gravity. They also set off switches, leading to all sorts of surprises. <laughs> Amazingly, nearly everything fell into place. I'm Christopher Glenn with Domino Record Buster in the news. <laughs> This is CBS. 
in the news the deep sea dives of deep rover recently scientists have been exploring the depths of california's monterey canyon in a new type of submarine we'll be back with some of their underwater discoveries in the news here are a few words about levi's jeans and cords <laughs> It's going to rain cats and dogs and in other news, Tommy Fisher is And now, Deep Rover, down in the depths, in the news. Deep Rover is a new type of submarine. It dives more than 2,000 feet below the ocean's surface. But what makes it special is that it can go just about anywhere the pilot wants. Unlike other deep diving craft, it is not tied or attached to ships on the surface. This freedom has opened up a new world for underwater explorers. Here, off the coast of California, they dive into an undersea canyon larger than Arizona's Grand Canyon. What they've seen and photographed has amazed even experts. An eel pout that protects itself by coiling up to try to look like a type of jellyfish that other fish wouldn't want to eat. Siphonophores, colonies of animals divided up so that some parts are responsible for food while others are in charge of protection. And a narcomedusa, a jellyfish that has its own lighting system called bioluminescence. That's not unusual down here where the sun's light never reaches. 80% of the animals here generate their own light. Occasionally, when scientists want to capture one of these rare animals for further study, they just suck it up with Deep Rover's slurp gun. It doesn't hurt the creature. These deep dives have changed scientists' view of the number of animals living in the ocean and opened new possibilities for feeding mankind with life from the sea. I'm Christopher Glenn with the discoveries of Deep Rover in the news. In the news, locked out on the St. Lawrence. The main water highway from the Great Lakes to the Atlantic Ocean is blocked off by a breakdown in a lock, a big elevator for ships. We'll be back with the St. Lawrence Seaway in the news. And now, a roadblock on a highway for ships in the news. The St. Lawrence Seaway connects the Great Lakes with the Atlantic Ocean, letting ships carry such cargoes as grain and iron ore from the Midwest to the rest of the world. Between the ocean and Lake Erie, the water level rises nearly 600 feet. To make that climb, especially around Niagara Falls, ships pass through locks, giant ship elevators. A ship going upstream enters a nearly empty lock, the doors are closed and water is let in to raise the ship to the level of the water beyond the lock. Normally, this is the busiest time of year on the St. Lawrence Seaway because by mid-December, heavy ice on the St. Lawrence River will close the passage to most ships. But the seaway is closed right now, not by ice, but by a crumbling concrete wall that temporarily trapped a ship in lock number seven on the Welland Canal around Niagara Falls. Repair work is underway, but meanwhile, Great Lakes shipping is at a standstill, getting backed up as ships approach the canal and have nothing to do but wait. The lock breakdown is affecting shipping and the jobs that depend on it as far west as Chicago, Illinois, and even Duluth, Minnesota, halfway across the continent at the western end of the water highway from the Atlantic. Officials have now cleared the damaged lock and hope to have the seaway open to traffic again by next week. I'm Christopher Glenn with a traffic jam on the St. Lawrence Seaway in the news. This is CBS. In the news, an Indian tribe comes back to life. 32 years ago, the Klamath Indians lost their reservation and their tribal rights. This week, they got back their tribal rights. We'll be back with the Klamath Indians in the news. And now, the Klamath Indians in the news. The Klamath Indians of Oregon are celebrating. 
After 32 years without tribal rights, the Klamaths are a tribe again. They stopped being a tribe in 1954, when the federal government decided that the 2,000 Klamaths should mingle into the mainstream of American life. The government took away their reservation, nearly a million acres of Oregon timberland, and took away rights they had under an old Indian treaty that provided them with health care, education, and economic benefits. In return, the government gave the Klamaths cash payments that averaged out to $75,000 per person. It was called fair market value. Looking back, the tribal chairman says the Klamaths were totally unprepared to handle large sums of money, and they failed to mix in with other Americans. In 10 years, nearly half the Klamaths had no money left. Other Indians accused the Klamaths of having sold out. Eventually, the government realized that the money it had forced on the Klamaths was more of a curse than a blessing. And last month, Congress restored the Klamaths' tribal rights to medical, educational, and economic benefits. The government could not give back their land. That reservation is gone forever. But the Klamaths were happy to celebrate being a tribe again. And when it rained, they just moved into the high school gym. I'm Christopher Glenn with the Klamath Indians in the news. In the news, a man and his bean shooter. Rufus Hussey, who lives in Seagrove, North Carolina, just might be the best bean shooter there ever was. Bean shooter is Hussey's name for a slingshot. He and his brother have been making them and using them since they were kids. In the early days, they'd find just the right kind of Y-shaped branch, pull the tongues out of old shoes to use as thongs, and cut up old inner tubes for the rubber pulls. Hussey still makes his bean shooters by hand. He started numbering his work 14 okay, years sir. ago but and I is nearly up to number 6,000. And that doesn't count the thousands he made in the 40 years before that. Of course, Hussey is never without his own bean shooter. When he needs some weeds cut down, he just takes aim and fires. Anything around the barn that isn't nailed down is fair game for Rufus Hussey and his bean shooter. I'm Christopher Glenn with Rufus Hussey, the bean shooter man, in the news. This is CBS.